Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Today, we are sitting down with the Director of Operations and Risk for Hop In Technologies based in Ontario, Mr. Raul Jane. Uh, Hop In offers logistics and planning software to organize corporate shuttles for the daily commute. Raul, thank you so much for doing this. Long time no see. Uh, I guess thank I should have said much. this beforehand as well. Raul and I go way back to my days when I was back in Clarington, Ontario, uh, Bowmanville, and we, we have known each other and we connected recently after our month-long series on municipal leaders. So thanks so much for reaching out and thanks so much for wanting to come on the show and talk about transportation. Thank you very much for having me, Chris. So Raul, I want to start with the uh, million dollar question that I want to sort of get on the table right off the bat, and that is... What does transportation mean to you? So that way I have an understanding of how this conversation and my listeners and my viewers might have a better understanding on what it means to you. So that way we'll dive a little bit deeper later. Yeah, the obvious answer is transportation is getting, you know, items, people from point A to point B. For me, it means opening up opportunities for people that, you know, haven't quite had those opportunities opened up for Um you know, I, I, as you know, I live very close to Toronto and they have a robust transit system. And that's great because you can live anywhere in the GTA. And as long as you have the time, you can um, get to anywhere in, in Toronto. Um, but the further you get out of the city, the harder that is. Um, you know, with, with people choosing to drive less and less, whether it's due to inflation whether it's due to the just the you know the extra burden of having a vehicle, the cost of all, or as we're noticing now with trends, the younger generation less and less likely to get their driver's license. These people are going to be focused into living in the city towards them. And Canada is a huge country, and we have a lot of beautiful communities in rural Canada that are not going to get the population that they need to sustain themselves to keep their businesses going. Um, unless we can get transit figured out. How do we figure it out? Because there are so many unknown variables in the transit market right now, whether it be the young people, like you said, who are not uh, getting their driver's license. So the reliance on highway driving is not there. There is the rural aspect of getting more people out to the rural communities, but also having that connection into larger metropolitan cities like here in Alberta, Calgary, and Edmonton and Ontario, uh, Toronto, Saskatoon, Regina, so on and so forth. How do we fix a problem when there are so many unknown variables that we don't know what it's going to look like, the transit market or the transit system in 10 to 15 years? So that's a great question. So let's let's start with some, some just facts across North America. Um, I love facts. I love facts on this yeah. show. <laughs> Transit doesn't turn a direct profit. So if a community is looking at saying, well, we're not going to make money on transit directly, then they're absolutely right. What transit does is it boosts the economy. It gets people um, from point A to point B to get to work. It gets people to the grocery store, to the local hairdresser. Um, so the, the benefit of transit just can't be measured in in direct dollar and cents, right? Now, with respect to your question about where we're going to be in 15 years, I think what we have to realize is that in 15 years, we're still going to need transit. But what is happening right now, um, you know, especially in Ontario, but generally across Canada, Housing has become unaffordable in the city. So people are forced to move further and further out of the city. The further and further you go to the city, the less transit there's available. So then the further you move out, the more expenses you have to incur based on having a vehicle, gas, insurance, wear and tear, maintenance, all this stuff on top. So transit here, transit's here to stay. Um, you bring up a good point, and I just want to—I'm going to do a little bit of a throwback to our month-long series on municipal politics and municipal governments on the cross-border interviews. And 
a lot of the mayors and counselors that I was talking to in more traditional rural communities, yes, they are cities and towns, but they, they're they not big metropolitan cities like capital cities like Toronto and Edmonton. They were saying they're having a hard time attracting, A, workers to their communities, but also businesses to their community. It, it, you make a good point there, and I want you to expand on it a little bit about the idea that Without transit, your community could potentially be in a stalemate where you're not really doing anything because you're not attracting investments with a re- robust transit connection to metropolitan areas. Yeah, so let's actually, you know what I like to do in this scenario because you're not the first person who's asked me uh, this, this sort of question. Let's actually create a scenario here, right? So you have rural Canada. Uh, a, a, a town, a city in rural Canada. It doesn't matter where in Canada it is, but it's in rural Canada. Um, what happens is you've got families that are growing up there. They've chosen to live out there. They moved out there in the 70s and 80s and 90s. They have cars. They've got good jobs in the local community. And then those kids start to grow up. And they get old enough to go to college or university. So they move because rural Canada doesn't really have colleges and universities. So they move to Toronto or they move to Calgary. And then what happens is they go do the four-year degree. Now they, you know, most students going to university come out with that. Not as much as our US counterparts, but they come out with still that. So then what happens is they graduate university and they've got this debt to deal with. So where is where are the jobs right now? The entry level positions in most university-based degrees. They are in the cities. So they move to the city. Right. Finance. Um, you know, if you go to degree, let's, let's, let's break out some of the common ones: engineering, finance, computer science, and uh, and uh, you know, just the you've done a lot of municipal interviews, uh, political science. All right. So those cities are based out of the, the those, those careers predominantly are based out of the cities. And so what happens is they move into the city. They don't need a car. They're working. They're paying off their debt. But no one's moving back into that rural community to move from. So that community now is struggling because they've got lumber mills, factories. They've got good paying jobs. But they don't offer the amenities that the big city has. Would you say that still in today's society? I apologize to interrupt. It's just in today, over the last three years, we have seen the rise of remote teaching, remote education, remote workforce, and the need for being in larger urban centers is not there. While this might be a blip and we might be returning to post pre-pandemic levels of people wanting to be in classes, wanting to be in the workforce, could the last two years change how people look at transit as well? It, it can, but let's let's see what's happening right now, right? So for two years, the, the, you know, we've all worked from home. Most of us have. Um, now, a lot of companies are going back to a hybrid model, right? So they still, we still get the perks of working from home two to three days a week, maybe even four days a week, but they still want you in the office a couple of days, maybe even a day a week. Just for that team building, that that social interaction that helps, you know, I call it coffee chat, the coffee cooler chat, to be honest, right? It's 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 the non-work related conversations that you have on the fly that I think makes people enjoy their job. It's the hey Chris, what did you do this weekend? Or or hey, and you I, can't I heard, get you know, the connection like you do in person as you do via Zoom. Like it'd be great to be able to sit down with you right now and have this conversation. But absolutely, we live in two different provinces, and this is the way that we have to work it out. But I I, I agree wholeheartedly on your statement there. Yeah, and so like let's 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 you know, COVID has allowed us to do international business from the beauty of your living room. Right. Um, that's great. But businesses, um, the employees of a business, when you're building a team environment, right, they they need that social interaction. Right. So hybrid is going to, I think the, the wave of the future is, is hybrid. Right. 
But now there are still jobs out there. A lot of the good paying jobs for people are in person. You know, let's look at like, let's look at Durham region. You're, you both, you and I are, you know, from Durham region. If you, for those who don't know, Durham region is a, a region just outside of uh, Toronto on the east side. It encompasses the major cities being Pickering, Ajax, Whitby, Oshawa, Clarington, and Skuga. All right. So those are the, the, the six towns. Don't forget Uxbridge. Town. Don't forget about oh, yeah, Uxbridge. Oh, yeah. Uxbridge. Sorry. <laughs> yes, yes. Uxbridge. Um, so there's a seven. Um, we have GM here. Everybody has heard of GM. It's build a car. You can't do that over a highway. Right? We have Ontario power generation. Here. There, uh, we have two of, you know, we have two nuclear power stations. You can't produce power remotely. We have, um, you know, even for younger people, we have grocery stores, pharmacies, retail that was still uh, allowed to be open during the pandemic. Those jobs weren't handled remotely. I, you know, I don't know how I'd react if I walked into my local grocery store and I had to talk to a computer screen um, and arbitrarily have them check out things. Uh, so there's still always going to be jobs that are that are um, in person. And now let's look at rural Ontario for a second. Rural Ontario, when Microsoft or Meta or Google or Amazon move into a country, they don't move to rural Ontario. They move to the cities. Now, even these companies are starting to pivot to have people more and more coming into work. But tech has always been that, you know, rodeo where people can work remotely, right? But they're, they're even moving to the cities now. So, so those jobs that these, these young people want when they graduate, they're located in the cities. The jobs that are kind of in the rural area, if you will, a lot of those jobs are actually you know, in-person sort of position. So why don't you think municipalities, particularly rural municipalities, because we all know, like we all know TTC, we all know the uh, the Calgary transit system. We, we know the big metropolitan city transit systems. But when you look at more rural communities, say uh, Brooks and Drumheller and even in Ontario with Newcastle or going up north to Lindsay and like Minden. So why don't more rural Rural municipalities start looking at the transit as a priority, or is it because, like you said, at the literally at the beginning of the episode, transit is not a money maker, so you don't want to throw tax dollars after something that's not going to make a return on investment. So yeah, so I think I think it's part of it's the way we've always done it, right? We've always done it by having governments pay for transit exclusively, whether it be municipal, regional, or or you know assistance from the province or federal government. It's always been a government initiative, um, and 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 the way I look at transit in smaller communities is, you know, uh, I lived in a small community. I lived in uh, multiple ones. I lived in a town called Deep River, which is in the Ottawa Valley, and I lived in a place called Port Elgin. <laughs> which is uh, in Bruce County, both in Ontario. Um, we, you know, the one thing that I always tell my wife, because she's, you know, 100% 416 Toronto sort of person, um, is that small communities really do feel like a family. And by no means, when I say small community, am I talking 50 people? At the time when I lived there, there's been, you know, 4,500 and 5,500 people in the community. So, it's not like we knew everybody, but there was a sense of community. If, if if I was running late to get home when I was in high school and, and someone was on the street, this was before the time of cell phones, um, you know, there were many times when I'd be like, hey, excuse me, ma'am, would you mind calling my mom and let her know that I'm running late? But I didn't have a cell phone. And she'd say, yeah, no problem. And she'd call. Like, it was just this, you know, very safe community of past. So with these small communities, we we almost sell the community to the public as move here because we're a family. But if we're really a family, that burden shouldn't just come from the municipal government. 
or the county government. It should have the state, all the stakeholders pitching in to solve the problem. Because they're the ones who are going to get hurt if we don't have a solution. So I can give you an example of a project we're working on right now. It's in North Cumberland County, which for those who aren't from Ontario is the county that is east of Durham region. So there you go. Um, we're literally what just heading about? down. We're heading east on the 401 for those who are listening to this. So yeah. get off, get out of the airport and just head east is what we're saying. You'll, you'll see it. You might even see one of our buses. So what happened was there is a North Cumberland Manufacturers Association that identified that they were having recruitment retention issues. They needed an innovative solution. And so what we did is we sat down with the, the Manufacturers Association and we said, okay, Let's see where your manufacturing like, locations are, and let's build a bus route that just picks people up to take them to work. That's it. And the, each manufacturer will pitch in a little bit to cover the cost, because they're the ones who are benefiting in this. And so we did that. And then the county and Metrolinx, which is our provincial transport, the public transportation body, they saw what we were doing, and they wanted to be part of the solution also. So the county put money in and Metrolinx put money in. And now what's happened is the bus routes are still predominantly tailored towards the manufacturing association. But if those routes and those times work for you and you're you know, a regular citizen of the county, you know, or anyone in the county, I guess, really not even a citizen, but who doesn't work at those facilities, you can hop on the bus, right? And so what we do is we created a ticketing portal for them so they can buy the tickets. And now, so in, in, in this one example, I now have business, provincial government, regional government, and the end user all at my stakeholders right now. And they're all pitching into the solution. Wow. Now, one of our buses actually goes all the way to the Oshawa Go station because an area that people identified was we work in Toronto and it's, we have to drive there. And Oshawa Go station has limited parking. You know, there's a risk. You drive all the way to Oshawa and there's no parking. What do you do? So we set up a shuttle to take you to and from Coburg to to um, the Oshawa Go station. Yeah. Right. But by having this multiple stakeholder collaborative solution, what we've done is we've given a community that normally doesn't have transit, we've given them the start of a transit. So what's what's the what's the average? Because you talk about the manufacturing companies who wanted this, who saw a need for this, right? And it's an interesting scenario that you've placed, and an interesting program that has been launched in Northumberland County. I remember reading about it a little bit in depth uh, when it first was announced, and then the provincial government also said something. David Pacini, the local MPP, said something as well. And I, I was sitting there and I was going, "Okay, that's great." But what's the ridership, right? Because for Northumberland County, for those for to compare apples to oranges here, Northumberland County for my Alberta and Saskatchewan listeners is roughly about Red Deer to Drum Heller. So Red Deer would be Port Hope, Drum Heller for Northumberland County would be, I believe it's Colburn is the edge of it, or Colburn. Yeah. One or the other. Yeah. And one or the other. So Northumberland County is a quite a large area. So it is a vast, and there's a lot of smaller communities, like a lot of small, small communities in there. So what is the ridership for that first initial intake of manufacturer employees who needed this? Do you have those stats? Because I think it's a fascinating so, story. It is. And I don't have the stats. I don't have the, the running stats on a month over month basis, but I can tell you right now that we're approaching 200 riders who signed up to the portal. And a actively like a, a, like a week or a month or a... so so or just two uh, like what do you mean by two hundred riders like is that two hundred two hundred user accounts if you will set up on the okay. portal right now um which you know on its own um doesn't you know doesn't you 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 would think doesn't sound impressive except um when you when you look at it, it's growing month over month still. Okay. Because as more people are taking it, they're talking about it. So we launched this in September of just right? this year, 2022. So just this year. Oh, that's so awesome. it's been, you know, two and a half months. But let's talk about the impact those 200 people are having right now. So 
Northumberland County, much like Northern Alberta, is beautiful. All right. Um, there's such an there's such a drive to keep that area beautiful. You know, there's a, a lot of green initiatives that happen in both areas. There's a lot of focus on the environment, on keeping things natural. We're taking a significant amount of pollution out of the air. We're also, for the users of the service, we're taking a significant amount of stress and anxiety out of their day because they no longer have to go to work. I mean, not go to work, but they drive to work. They do have to go to work, just to be clear here. But the, the other thing that we're doing, though, is we're proving to, you know, big city people that smaller communities warrant some sort of trend. The unfortunate part when you're talking about federal or provincial money normally, historically, going for a proposal like transit, is they look like in Ontario, they look at mainly Ottawa and and in Toronto. Now there are other transit systems in, in, in Ontario, but they're usually you know a lot of them have overlap with college or university communities, um, because there's a high high number of students there, right? But but those two areas, Toronto and Ottawa, are our big economic powerhouses. I mean, Ottawa also has the benefit of being the capital of the country. So so you know, a lot of money, a lot of money from multiple levels goes to those areas in order to help support their transit. It really hurts small, you know, smaller communities then because you almost have to fight to prove that you need it. Right. So how do you fight? How do you fight in that type of scenario? Because you're Ontario is not a, a lone duck in this situation. And here in Alberta, I used to work for a municipality and they always wanted to deal, talk about transit because the Greyhound had just shut down. They were not servicing local communities anymore in Northern Alberta. And it was a big economic loss for the community because there was a lot of people, like you said, who did not have a driver's license, who did not deal with, uh, who did not have a car, who, relied on public transportation to get them to and from Slave Lake to Edmonton, which is a three and a half hour drive on a good day. So when people are looking and they're saying, okay, we want to do transit, but we don't have the funding. We don't, we are a small rural community of 10,000 people who would love to be able to get together with uh, our manufacturers or our businesses, but we need some government spending as well. And every time we talk about transit, we talk about Edmonton, we talk about Calgary. We don't talk about the smaller communities, right? Because it's a hard sell to say, give us a million dollars for 10,000 people to use a bus to go back and forth to Edmonton each week, right? Right. So what we did in North Carolina, we focused on what was the, the, the you know, I like to call it huh, the low-hanging fruit, but what was the problem first identified to us? Manufacturing companies were unable to get their human capital to um, work. So let's solve that problem first. Once we solve that problem, the county started noticing us. Now, I'm not saying they're funding the whole project. They're not putting millions upon millions upon millions of dollars. But they were willing to extend enough funding for us to do a trial period. And Metrolinx heard about us, and they came and let us do a pilot project. Right? It's about creating awareness. You know, we, um, we in, in Ontario, uh, unfortunately, this year, we've had two elections. We've had our provincial election, and we had a municipal election that just passed a couple of weeks. Um, regardless of what party people are in or, or um, you know, municipally, you know, what, what, what their position is on issues, Ultimately, every politician has said the same thing. We care about our constituents and we want to make our constituents' lives better. Because I really believe firmly that this country is not electing somebody who says, I don't really care about people. All right. So it, this is really where you have to stick to your convictions as a, as a municipal politician and say, listen, we're going to try this out because what we're doing right now isn't and that's that, that's the crutch of it, right? What, what what are we doing right now? We keep running back to a 
higher level of government saying, hey, I need money for transit, and they keep saying no. So I've, we've been doing that for, for the last, you know, probably 50 years, probably. I don't know. I'm not 50 years old, but it seems like something we keep doing over and over again. Um, because it's great, because when we don't have transit, it's not my fault. Right? It's, 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 well, it wasn't me. I, I went to the governing body. They said no. So let's focus all our attention over there. What we need now, I think, in, in 2022, 2023, post COVID world, is innovative solutions. And that means, you know, you're willing to take a risk. Coming from someone, by the way, who's a director of operations and risk. I do this on a daily basis where I, I evaluate risk versus reward and how much we're willing to expose ourselves. Um, we all do this in a, a, our day-to-day -day lives with every decision we make, whether we're conscious of it or not. But for some reason, when government tries to do it, people put up roadblocks. And what we need governments to do and businesses to do is sit down at the table and say, listen, we're willing to put some money into this project if you are to solve our combined problem. And once we have a solution that is solving our problem, let's then go to the, the governing agencies and say, listen, this is our solution. This is what it's costing us. I need you to put in this money. So we Let's we've stopped relying on on people to come up with the solutions for our communities, and let's come up with our own. We have talked about busing for a large part of this, but transit is not just busing. Commuting is not just no. busing. There's trains, there's cars, there's bikes, there's planes. You name it, transit it encompasses a lot. While we have been focusing on uh, busing a lot here in the last few uh, minutes, in Alberta, there is a big push right now for trains, 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 trains. Uh, our current premier, Daniel Smith, wants a train to go from Fort McMurray to Grand Prairie, which is a pretty far distance. They want a train to go from Edmonton to Calgary, a train from uh, Calgary to uh, uh, Banff, a downtown uh, Calgary train from the downtown of Calgary to the airport. Trains is a big thing here in Calgary. Should we be looking at different models of transit as well, besides just busing, or is it is busing where it's at right now? No, yeah, well, absolutely, we should be looking at all different sort of methods of, of of you know transit. the The thing is, we have trains here in Ontario. They're called the Go Train, right? So. And my if, parents if, lived, if they're running, <laughs> sorry, a little yeah. little jab there yeah. for my time back in two yeah. thousands. <laughs> But, but my parents live on the eastern edge of Scarborough, which is part of Toronto. And I can take a bus downtown for, I do normally take the go to, I think it's like 325, right? Um, that's just me putting money in the machine, by the way. I'm sure you get a discount if you use a pass or something. Or I can take the go train downtown, which is almost $7. Um, Trains are great. They get me, you know, what would be a two-hour commute becomes a 35-minute commute. So trains cost more money. And my piece on transit is, let's start with the buses to help the local area first. And then let's start building out. Once, you, once I prove to you there is a need for a bus transit system, I've already have you thinking now about other transportation methods that could help my community, right? I, trains cost a lot of money. You know, planes, trains, they all cost a lot of money. If we can't get municipalities to buy in on a lower cost bus solution, right? It's gonna be really difficult to get them to buy in on a train solution because at the end of the day, I can sell that if, if, if my bus solution doesn't work, right? You've got companies like Hoppin Technologies who, through partnerships, we provide the buses, we provide the drivers. At the end of the trial period, if it's not working, the trial period is over. You say, thank you very much. You wash your hands of it and there's no more expenses. You can't do that with trains. 
You know, I can't get a company to lay the track for a year just to test it out and see how it works. And then find out I don't like it and say, okay, we'll pull the tracks up, use them again. That, that doesn't work with trades. Like, you know, the, just even saying it is is so ridiculous that I can't believe I just said it. But but buses work in that in that model. There is an absolute value. Those long distances that are like four hour trips via a car, they don't magically get shorter because you're on a bus. Right. So so for those long travels, you need a more efficient means than a vehicle on the road and that's where trains come into right? Um, but for for like you know within a, a relatively you know if you can drive it in say an hour hour and a half sort of radius right buses work well there I, I don't want to. I don't want you to give away your secrets, but I want to ask this question to start the conversation in people who, in people's minds mm-hmm. who are listening to this right now. Say if there's a business leader out in a rural community listening to this right now, or a local councillor in their a, a rural community, or even in a large uh, metro city, who are who's thinking to themselves, maybe we do have an issue. Maybe our community has an issue that we need to address with busing or with a train or with different types of transit that we are not relying on or not even thinking about right now, what should they do? What is the first step? And I know you're going to say contact hop in technologies because that's probably the first thing that you'd want them to do. But what is the first step that they should be doing? Is it looking at different options? Is it looking at potential situations where they could partner? What is the first step? Because in a journey, the hardest step is always the first step. But the, the first step is talking to the people in your community to see if there is a desire for that solution, okay? That's the first step. In fact, that's our first step, by the way. So, so you know, I, I, I will tell you our process because I think it's a, I think generally it's a good process to have regardless if you go with Hopin or you're doing it yourself. I, I think it's a good process. So first thing we do is we do an impact analysis. So if we're dealing with a private business, we 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 send out a survey to the employees saying, hey, you know, first of all, you know, where do you live? We use postal codes to figure that out. And, you know, what's your you know hours of work and 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 you know, would you use the service? I mean, there's it's more detailed than that, but but ultimately that's what it is. And we look at that. And if there is a if there's a desire for that that service, then we proceed to to looking at solutions. The first step is always talking to your constituents. Do you or, think, or, or, or employees? Do you think there is a desire out there? I, I'm going to ask the the overarching question here that because we are living in a more well in Alberta at least. Hey, we all have our big F one fifties. We all like our big trucks. It's costing us an arm and a leg. We like to bitch and complain on Twitter about it. Do you think there's a desire to move to a uh, more robust transit system that is inclusive of all types of transit in, in 2023 as 2022 is almost over? Yeah, I, I do. And, and I'll tell you why. Um, you know, what you, go, what, what you mentioned about Alberta is, 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 you know, what I've always seen whenever I've come to Alberta, to be honest, is, you know, the big truck sort of sort of scene, but what I've noticed now in the last, I'm going to say, ten years that I didn't notice before was a lot of environmental protests and concerns being raised out of Alberta. Right? Um, look for the people in Alberta. I'm not one of those people who are like, you know, um, get rid of the pipelines, get rid of oil, all that sort of stuff. I'm not. That's not me. Every job you have has an environmental footprint. Don't get me wrong, oil is probably a bigger one than working in an office, but but it's people's careers, it's people's livelihoods, it's people's futures. So how do we minimize the environmental impact? And I think that's what you're seeing a lot happening in Alberta right now, right? Is people talking about the fact that we're not we're not getting rid of the oil sand. It's just not happening. Um, but how do we minimize that footprint? So, you know, we, we talk a lot about like, you know, 
in, in Hamilton, they talk about those coal scrubbers that they can put in the in the stats and everything. That's all great. All, all those initiatives are great, but you still have people driving to and from work. That can be a lot of people. Like think of like, I'm not going to pick Toronto because it's the biggest city in um, Canada. But let's pick an Alberta city, Calgary. You know, how many people work for City Hall? And they're driving, most of them, I bet you, are driving to and from work. Yet City Hall is going to stand up and say they have um, green initiatives and they're working on all these projects to lower emissions and, and help the environment. You've got all the people coming to work. And I'm not picking on Calgary because it's not just Calgary that does this. No, it's but every. It, but... No, and I agree it's everyone, and I think there's a lot of uh, discussion right now about the uh, the leaders taking the lead on these issues. Right? You gotta, you gotta, you gotta show us that you're willing to walk the walk instead of just walk the talk. Right? So tell us, tell us, and show us that you're willing to do this. And I think there's a lot of people here in Calgary, and I and I'm not picking on Calgary as, 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 at all as well because I know some of the councilors here, and they they all seem like they're doing great things. I, I know some take transit, some do drive. I don't know about all the other. Uh, staff members but i can tell you that there's probably a lot because every time i'm downtown there's never a parking spot that i can find no and, and let's talk that's a great point to point out here right now right we're talking about urban sprawl all over the place right now right yeah. they're, they're they're you know tearing down farmland forest we've got protected areas now because we're so concerned about it we had to say this part cannot be touched right the sliver of trees has to stay here because we're not turning our country into a parking lot. All right, we're not just paving over everything. But look at any downtown center, those parking lots that are there right now that are full of cars. And while we're talking about, um, you know, a, a crisis in buying a home or forget buying a home, renting a home. There's a lot of opportunity to reduce the carbon footprint in the city centers, right? Um, I believe London, England has done this now, where they've implemented these like rings around the town, the downtown, where if you drive, you have to pay a toll. Um, or maybe they've even banned driving by now. I'm not really sure now. But but they they realized that you know when they implemented it that that it's not sustainable to have this many cars down. It's not going to be sustainable for any of our major cities. No. But once, once you can't live in a major city, then you move away from the major city. And then you drive to like, you know, in, in, in the example of Durham region, you drive to the GO train station. Well, the GO train parking lot fills up now. Right? So now you're, you're, you haven't solved the problem. You've just kind of spread it around. But the, you know, the, as you get closer and closer to the city, the population gets higher and higher. The problem is just keeps getting worse and worse, right? Um, if you look at, you know, look at just look at any city of of even say, I don't know, a hundred thousand people, which is not a big city by by Canadian standards. Go to the mall on the weekend. Go to the grocery store. Those parking lots are full. I know this because I live in a town of, I don't even know what the population of Curtis is right now. I, I'm going to just say it's 30,000 for you know lack of a better number. The no frills parking lot, fresh fill and food basic lots are full. Those are my three grocery stores. Yeah. If we had buses to, to, to take us there, right, maybe some of those cars wouldn't be there. Oh, I, w I want to turn to the last segment before we wrap up here, Earl, and that is established transit systems that, that mm -hmm. are already in place. Because I will admit, I, I have not been in Toronto in a while. I've not, well, I have. I was there during the provincial election, and I, I don't, I didn't go on any transit system besides renting a car and driving it to my hometown of Clarington. Um, here in Calgary, I can go by my transit system the the trains that are in uh the northeast calgary and i can tell you they're always full they are mm -hmm. packed to the brim at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day like if you go at seven o'clock at night there's usually like 
12 people in the trains, but during peak hours, how important is it to reevaluate your transit systems on an ongoing basis? Because I think that's a big thing that a lot of municipalities just assume it's great. They're working. Let's just keep them the way they are. Like you said, we've done it this way in the past. Let's just continue doing it. How important is it to reevaluate going forward? It's very important. <laughs> like when you have buses on the road, um, it's very important to reevaluate your system. If you look at where we're coming to in every industry now, we're talking about um, finding efficiencies and making using data to provide direction on how we do things. So, you know, this is kind of where you know hop in kind of fits in because we provide that data. So you can say, okay, you know what, bus one is really busy between nine and eleven, and or seven and eleven, and three and seven p.m. Right, but bus two is not really busy. So during those peak times, let's move bus two over to support bus. And then we'll send it back. Because the solution to climate change isn't putting, it, it is putting buses, it's putting more buses on the road. Where you need them is the piece that people always forget. It's not just replacing cars with buses. That's not the solution. It is saying, okay, during rush hour, if that bus we have is full, then people aren't going to take it and they're going to drive their car. So during rush hour, let's, Pull from routes that aren't as busy. Put them on the busy routes. And then we can redisperse it. And it's making those pivots that are is vitally important to the longevity of our transit system. Look, Calgary, Edmonton, you know, all the all the provincial capitals and Ottawa. They've done a reasonably good job with transit. All right, in that they're making decisions that are pretty tough, right? Because everybody wants transit in their neighborhood, but every bus is very expensive. Hiring the people to ride the buses are, of sorry, to drive the buses are, is a is a, is a long term commitment effort. That's kind of where Hoffman jumps in. So we're not, and before you invest in buying a bus to to augment your transit on a route you think you may or may not have the ridership you need, let us come in and do a proof of concept. Run a pilot with, with, with us, and then after six months, if it doesn't work, you're done. You can wash your hands of it. You can say we tried it. That route doesn't have the, the ridership we need to sustain it. If it works, and it's working you know, swimmingly well, then you're done with us and say, listen, thank you for all the data. We can, we, this justifies us buying a bus and hiring those five extra drivers we need now. But we've done it after we have the data. We're not just kind of spending money in the blind. Which governments know, have no idea how to do that. They, they spend money always oh. wisely half the time. Um, so for those who have been listening to this conversation and they want to learn a little bit more, but also reach out and get pick your brain and potentially have you come out to Western Canada and talk to them about transit and helping them out, how can they do that? So our website is uh, www.hopintech.com. So H-O-P-I-N-T-E-C-H.com. Uh, or you can email me uh, directly at Rahul at hopintech.com so it's r a h u l at hopintech.com all in word um the links will be in the show notes so if you're listening to this yeah. just scroll back and you can click on if you're listening watching this on youtube scroll down and check out this uh, uh the show notes but continue roll sure. i just want to i just want to just say one more thing we touched on it briefly and like why is transit important for rural ontario so let me give you a story of my, my actual life here. It'll take two minutes. I grew up in a place called Deep River. You clearly know about it because you were cheering when I said it. My, that was my, my dad's first job in the nuclear industry. Oh, okay. Um, so when I went to Deep River, the population of about 5,500 people, and uh, they had one, two, three, four. So they had three public one, two, three, four public schools and one Catholic school. Okay. 
you know, I fell down the, the Google rabbit hole a couple of months ago and I decided to Google my old school. They're gone. So grades one through the way it used to work was, um, and I remember the schools I went to, so T.W. Morrison, for if anyone's from that school I went there, was uh, grades one through five or one through four. And then five, six, seven, eight was in a, a school called T's Public School. And then you graduated to high school and that was called McKenzie and you finished off your high school there. And now those three schools are in one building. So when I went to Morrison, there was probably, well, there was two schools, one on, the, one on one side, one on the other. They each probably had about, you know, 300 students. And, and T's probably had about 450 students. And the high school probably had about, they pulled from a lot of areas, probably had about, I'm gonna say about a thousand students. So either we have classes where people are sitting on top of each other now in that community, or there's not enough kids in that community anymore. So they had to fold class schools down. That's indicative of what's gonna happen to small town Canada. You know, um, I love small town Ontario. I grew up in small town Ontario. Um, I talk about it a lot. I talk to my friends who grew up in Toronto and some of the experiences I had in, in these small towns, um, unheard of in, in deep river, you know, there's a, there's the Ottawa river. We go swimming. I would, you know, cross country skiing, um, on, on Saturdays and Sundays with, the, with an organization called Jack Rabbit. Uh, in Port Elgin, we had one of the most beautiful beaches in Ontario, I would argue, in the world. Um, and I remember, you know, I was older at that point, you know, in high school. And I remember, you know, going to the going to the beach and having a bonfire at the beach and, you know, kind of that stereotypical sitcom sort of vibe you get in the, in the 90s, uh, you know, on, on, on the TV. I, I love those communities. They're great. They had downtowns, they had businesses. You know, when, if you got older, there were pubs. They had everything you needed, really in those communities, you know, barring a, a Best Buy or, or, or at the time Future Shop. And, and now what I notice is these communities, as people leave, people don't want to go back. You know, one of the solutions that we have to look at is how do we get immigrants into these communities? And, uh, and one of the things is immigrants aren't going to go there, right? When they, because there's, there's no way for them to get around. You know, you you ask an immigrant. You know, I'm, in case people can't tell, I'm a I'm a my parents were immigrants into this country. Um, you know, you ask, you, we, they leave their family, big families from my parents and their friends from India, and they move to Canada. And now you've got small communities who are trying to entice them to come to their community and set up roots. The problem is they don't have their driver's license in it, and so they can't. And if you don't have transit, they can't go around you just trapped them in their house so they're like okay it's great you have your property values lower there's a really good job there that's great you know what let me get my driver's license and then man i'll be there and then they go through our, our, our driver's license process and 18 months to a, two years later they get their license and when you go talk to them and say hey can you come back to the small town they're like no i already left my family in india we came to canada We've set up roots here. We have friends here. We have our kids in schools. We have friends. I could sell my family on leaving India for saying it's a better life here in Canada. I can't sell my family on leaving Toronto for an extra ten, fifteen thousand dollars a year. And so they they don't leave. And that's the problem. So if we want to help bolster rural Canada, and we can't get and we're, and we're, enti we're trying to entice new Canadians to come there. We need to give them what they need right from the minute they land in this country. So that when they talk about their new Canadian family, they're talking about the community of Deep River, of Port Elgin, of rural Alberta, Manitoba, Saskatchewan. That's what we have to do. Otherwise, they're not coming. Oh, I, I can't hear you, Chris. No, that was me. I coughed and I forgot <laughs> to unmute myself there. Um, I, I was saying that I agree wholeheartedly that we have 
people coming to our country on a regular basis and the federal government saying we want more, we are opening, uh, and we can't rely on those busy metropolitan cities to have them there anymore. And we can say there are such unique gems all across this country in small rural communities. And we need to start fostering an idea that to get more people into those small rural communities, we have to foster transportation, healthcare, and a lot more issues. So thank you so and, much. And when people move, when people move from India, I just want to point out that that even their smallest village in India is like a small city here in, in, in Canada. So That's when like, they move from from Delhi or Mumbai or Hyderabad, they're not envisioning Toronto when they come in. That's not what they're envisioning. They're envisioning their kids playing outside and in a safe community, and they can go swimming and they have, you know, they're riding bikes on the street. That's that's what they're envisioning. Because if you give them anything else, they could just stay back where they were from. And so, if you want those people to come here and and really make this their home, and so many of these rural communities have a lot to offer, right? You need to start with transit. Because once you get that new Canadian base in your community, that in itself will start them to open their own grocery stores and and people then will be applying to jobs in the local businesses. And then slowly that stigma of not belonging to a community that's not Toronto or Montreal, it slowly vanishes. But that's a that's a 10, 15 year transition. That needs to start today, not in 10, 15 years. Yeah, I agree. Um, Raul, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and pleasure to sit down and talk to you and pick your brain about transit. Uh, for those who are interested in learning more, like I said, the links to Raul's email, but also hopintech.com are in the show notes. So highly recommend you check them out. Uh, I think transit is one of these things that we need to be watching more closely moving into the future, not just like Raul said, dealing with it 10, 15 years from now, but dealing with it today and a lot more smaller municipalities, smaller governments, smaller communities need to start taking a proactive look at this and stop being more reactive in 10, 15 years saying, oh, we should have done it 10 years ago. Let's do it now. So with that, this has been the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown. As I say, always put down Twitter. Put down social media and go have a conversation with somebody. Helps our society, helps our democracy, and helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Crossword Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking. Mm -hmm.